Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're delighted that you're joining us today for this series. We're starting with the Community Providers, a key resource in reducing diabetes webinar. It's provided by the Maryland Department of Health. And we also want to thank the Maryland Health Education Centers for their work in helping to promote this webinar and for all the wonderful work that they do in terms of working with you uh, across the state. So we encourage you please to submit questions uh, via the question tab throughout the presentation. We will have time after the presentations for Q&A and we'll be able to have you open your mics by raising your hand at that time and we can assist uh, with direct questions as well. We have three really incredible speakers this morning, Anne Langley, Danielle Haskin and Asita Kelly. And right now I'm going to introduce Anne Langley, who is the director of the Center for Population Health Initiatives at the Maryland Department of Health. In this role, she is helping Maryland achieve specific population health improvement goals with an initial emphasis on diabetes. Anne, welcome, and we would love for you to start this off. I wanna remind everybody again to put your questions in the chat and take it from here. Uh, good morning, thank you, Sue. Um, I'm really um, thrilled that you're all here this morning. This is uh, the first of a series of eight webinars and it's great to have such uh, great participation and um, I'm really excited. Uh, I've only been in my role for um, about six months so this is the first uh, big initiative that we are um, kind of seeing to fruition since I started. So I'm very excited. I, um, I came to the Maryland Department of Health um, from working in the, in the hospital arena. And I'm really excited to be here where I can focus 100% um, of my time and energy on population health improvement. Um, so, and I'm really just um, providing an introduction this morning. I'm, um, um, I will share a little bit of information um, that comes mostly from the Diabetes Action Plan. Uh, the plan was cr created, written last summer, over most of the summer um, in 2019 and um, published in the late fall and really um, is a great foundation for us as we try to um, address diabetes in um, all different sectors for all different populations along the spectrum of health and um, um, and for those that are already um, impacted by diabetes. Um, it's just a great resource of information. I have the link um, later in the slides and I really encourage you to go and um, use that as background um, for, for various work that you do. Um, Let's see. So um, just, just some back, background numbers. Um, I was shocked when I started, I knew the, the terrible impact of diabetes, but um, the, the enormity of it in our state, I, I wasn't aware um, that 2.1 million people in Maryland are affected by prediabetes or diabetes. That's a, almost a third of the population in Maryland. Um, and to me, the most striking number is that 1.6 million people in Maryland have, um, and I, I say it's adults in Maryland, have prediabetes, and 90% of them don't know they have it. Um, that's one of the most concerning things for me because um, it's very difficult for people to take any action um, to change their behavior and their health if they um, don't don't even know that, that there is a problem. And um, prediabetes is a, a stage where you can actually really make a difference. People can turn that around and shift away from crossing over into diabetes. And that really is protective of their health. Um, um, diabetes is a sixth leading cause of death in Maryland. Um, that's important and it's striking, but it's, I think, even more important to know that um, um, cardiovascular disease is, is the top leading cause of death 
and it and diabetes are so intertwined and impact each other that really um, diabetes is having even more of, a, of an impact on mortality in the state. Um, and uh, this is um, a slide that just tries to summarize some of the costs. Um, uh, costs, that's some, uh, to me, this is something we tend to talk about more in the hospital sector um, than in the public health sector, but it's very important. Um, and it's, um, you know, not only is it having a dramatic impact on everyone in the state, but it's also, um, if, you, if you can't get people to um, make investments or change the way things are done to improve health, uh, sometimes um, to avert these costs is a, a good argument. Um, so, you know, seven billion in annual costs in Maryland as a result of diabetes and pre-diabetes, two billion just in loss in economic productivity. So um, that's a, a great argument for employers for uh, covering more uh, materials, supplies, medications, programs that will uh, support people. Um, then you have the medical costs, 4.9 billion. Um, people with um, diabetes have medical expenses that are two to three times higher than the average. And of all the healthcare dollars spent, in the state, about one out of seven is spent treating diabetes and its complications. This slide, I just didn't want to um, let this go by without noting the um, interaction of diabetes and COVID. Um, obviously, COVID, I know, has um, pretty much taken over everybody's lives, especially if you're working in healthcare, but everybody. Um, and we've heard that people with diabetes, diabetes is one of the chronic conditions that can make um, the impact of COVID um, more dangerous. Um, people with diabetes who um, get infected with COVID are more likely to require admission to the hospital or the ICU and to die than those without diabetes. Uh, the prevalence of diabetes and obesity, not just diabetes, but also obesity is higher in people, in COVID patients admitted to the hospital compared to those not admitted to the hospital. Um, I, I, lots of the research with COVID is very new, but there's, there is some evidence that it's not just having diabetes or being obese. People with blood sugar that isn't well controlled tend to have some of the same, like, uh, likelihood for poor outcomes. So um, it's a good reason, good argument for people who um, to take better care with their diabetes and to, to um, control that blood sugar. Um, this is another slide out of the plan and it just shows prevalence across the state. Um, uh, certainly there are some uh, jurisdictions in the state that um, struggle more than others, although as you can see, you know, uh, diabetes is prevalent across the state. Um, diabetes prevalence by race and ethnicity. Um, diabetes is one of those conditions that has a disparate impact on um, communities of color, non-white communities. Um, uh, we can, the, that's a whole nother webinar about um, um, why, all the different reasons why some of them, um, many of them, you know, related to things that are outside the direct realm of health, but have a huge impact. And I know you all are very familiar with all of that. I just wanted to, to note that here, that's a, another big part of um, the, why we need to address diabetes. So the plan, the Diabetes Action Plan, um, and one of the, the things I really like about it is that it addresses change in the entire population. It is not just about people with diabetes or people at risk for diabetes, but um, it offers um, information and strategies across the continuum. Um, so this slide shows um, the number of people in the healthy population. Um, uh, I talked to somebody recently who, you know, we were all talking about different measurements and things we should be looking at, and we were all far to the right 
you know, um, where people are already very sick. And she um, made a very good argument. She said, we really should pay more attention to increasing the percentage of the population that's in the healthy population category. Um, uh, we, you know, we don't pay enough attention there, which I agree with. So this is, um, I just wanted you all to have the link for sure to the plan, although it's very easy to Google Maryland Diabetes Action Plan, it will come right up. There's some other materials at the same place on the website um, that I think are, are informative. The introductory letter from Secretary Neal and former Deputy Secretary Phillips really um, explains well why the state, why this is such a priority. There's also a program inventory and a map and a data, data dashboard and a sort of a one page flyer of some of these facts that may be helpful for you to um, have. So um, the framework in the plan talks about actions and strategies that address the needs of populations across the continuum from healthy populations to those all the way over to very, you know, people with diabetes with very, with challenges, controlling their blood sugar and complications from the, due to the illness. Um, it recognizes upstream factors affecting the whole population and downstream factors that impact the highest risk populations. Um, and then again, it lists the target populations, healthy weight, overweight and obese, pre-diabetes and diabetes of pregnancy, and uh, managing diabetes and its complications. Um, so here I list some of the, the partners, partners that we have, partners that we hope to have. Um, as, you can, as you know already, as you can see from some of this information, um, I mean, di diabetes is not just uh, a, a problem that is addressed in the doctor's office or the hospital. Um, or you know even um, in a weight loss program, um, it impacts people all across their lives, and it um, and they need help and support from resources across the community um, in order to make a difference. We're um, going to have to um, really employ all of those different groups and um, and that's why this this webinar for those of you that are community health workers is so exciting to me and so critical because I know that you all are the ones out there um, knowing the resources finding the new assets connecting people to um, the things that they most need uh, so I think at that I will turn it over I again want to thank you all for coming I look forward to talking to you more over the coming months we're going to be out here with lots of different programs, um, building partnerships, and um, I hope uh, we'll get to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, for that wonderful presentation about the background, the impact of diabetes in the state of Maryland. And I'm going to, at this time, introduce uh, Danielle Haskin. She is the founder and senior advisor for It Looks Like Me, an organization that specializes in social and structural determinants of health. She is a community health worker with vast experience in working with people who have diabetes. And so, Danielle, we should be moving this over to you so that you can begin. Here we go. Take it away. Make sure you turn your mic on. Yes. Fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm ex always excited to speak with community health workers um, because in my eyes, I believe we really are the heart um, of the health of our community. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin, jump right in, starting with challenges to self-management um, of diabetes. And as you can see here, there are quite a few of them. Um, we just heard about some, you know, the other challenges, not just medically to diabetes, but right along with um, specifically difficulty incorporating or monitoring the treatment, uh, the physical activity into your lifestyle. It does require a lifestyle change. And for somebody to kind of all of a sudden, sometimes, you know, sometimes we do have the warning signs, but uh, sometimes those go ignored and all of a sudden we have to make drastic changes um, 
with the you know our our food monitoring and and taking you know our blood glucose and understanding how you know, important it is to track that, um, and then low capacity for understanding the health concepts. Um, everybody's health literacy rate is different. Um, language barriers. Do we have you know translation for you know our community members who may be new to the area? Um, also, there are a lot of uh, psychological issues that prevent self-care. Um, I'm sure you can um, respect, especially in a time you know like this with the pandemic. There's so much going on um, that we have to worry about in general, whether it's our family, our, our work situation. Um, that really managing a chronic disease um, like diabetes can can add to it and take a toll. So, depression, the lack of support that some people may have. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and poor mobility or other health issues that prevent self-care. So um, you'll hear the term comorbidities and sometimes there are a lot of times when people have chronic diseases, they have more than one. Um, so diabetes will affect our circulation. We might not be able to get around as well. Um, so that hinders the ability that we have to exercise like we need to. Um, financial barriers to paying for medications or services. Um, I mean, that's, that's, you know, not just with diabetes, but just in general, uh, the financial worries that we have, but especially maintaining the medications that we need, uh, maintaining the, the glucose strips and the testing kits and all of those things that come along with it, um, ex you know, presents challenges. Um, transportation issues that hamper regular office visits, um, depending on where we live, we know as community health workers um, in any of our counties, there are some areas that are more um, travel safe or travel friendly than others. There may be some outskirts rural areas that may not even have uh, public transportation. Um, and then along with that, limiting the access that we have to healthy fresh food so that our food insecure um, areas or our food deserts um, areas that make it difficult um, or challenging to get healthy foods at a reasonable price. Um, and you can see how all of these kind of tie in um, to, to one big cha challenge. So community health workers have proven to be successful. Um, and there is evidence of our effectiveness in, in improving the glycemic control and weight related outcomes among people with increased risk for type two diabetes. So both pre-diabetics um, and diabetics um, diagnosed. Um, especially when implemented in underserved communities, the interventions that community health workers um, participate in can improve health, can reduce other health disparities, and enhance overall health equity um, in the community that they work with. Um, so evidence from this review shows that programs that use community health workers to target populations um, at increased risk for type 2 diabetes um, we're able to, in, I guess, relate to the community in a, in a different way. So a lot of times we are, you may hear the term, the boots on the ground. So we're able to hear things and hear challenges that may not be addressed um, in a room full of medical professionals, for example. They could be really just looking at the um, the disease in itself and not realizing some of the other social determinants that we know, whether it's education or health liter literacy or transportation, um, that, that provides challenges to um, accessing some of the resources that we do have. So how can community health workers help? Um, we've talked about a few different areas or challenges that um, people experience. Um, so community health workers really can play a role um, all along the way, um, whether it's assisting with screening and health education. Um, there are uh, programs where community health workers can work one-on-one -on -one with um, even pre-diabetics or diabetics to educate them on how to use a, a glucose monitor, um, providing information on um, uh, how to track and, and maybe some journaling that, that's involved. What are you eating and, and what are your blood sugars like? And then looking at some um, trends that you might see. So the outreach and enrollment um, and, and the overall information. Um, so there are 
numerous programs available for diabetics and pre-diabetics and to kind of connect the pieces. So we have a program who needs people and a people who need the program. So being able to connect those two is really a strength that community health workers have um, by being involved in various capacities throughout the community. Um, you see areas that might have a higher need and then you can relay that information back. Um, also by being a direct member of a care delivery team. Um, interventions engaging community health workers for diabetes management uh, aim to improve the diabetes care and self-management behaviors among patients. Um, so using one of, one of the uh, models, community health workers deliver program content through group sessions. Um, they can do one-on-one -on -one sessions or interact with individuals. Um, also, they may provide education about diabetes prevention and lifestyle modification, a type of informal counseling, um, coaching, or just extending the support for the community members. Um, patient navigation kind of in, ties in with the outreach and enrollment, so um, referrals to those programs that you are aware of, um, and just by being overall community organizers. Um, sometimes there's a need to advocate for more programs. Maybe there's um, a lack of resources in a particular area and you're able as a community health worker to, to have the conversation with the community and see what they need, but then to also show them how powerful their voice is and ways that they can advocate for themselves and others around them um, through organization. This may look uh, familiar. So some of uh, this is actually uh, information to uh, medical providers. Um, and it said that um, providers should assess the social context of uh, diabetes, um, refer patients to local community resources when available, and provide patients with self-management support from lay health, out, health coaches, navigators, or community health workers specifically um, when available. So your value is, um, is absolutely being recognized and being championed all throughout healthcare. Um, it, it, they do realize that community health workers are a key factor in um, positive health outcomes. Um, so they say, again, providers should assess the social context to um, diabetes. And by working with community health workers, they're able to directly um, address some of those social contacts and not only focusing on um, the disease itself. Uh, so when CHWs are from or have close understanding of the community they serve, they're able to provide patients with culturally appropriate information and education on diabetes prevention, on lifestyle counseling, and informal counseling and social support. Um, it's very important that community health workers work in the community that they're serving uh, because you have a unique understanding of who's there um, an understanding of what resources are also there. Um, but also the background information that you bring to the table is invaluable. Um, so your situation is different from my situation, is different from somebody else's. Um, but you have a unique understanding of your, your own culture, for example, um, the different languages that you may speak, and um, you're able to bring that um, very valuable resource to the table to specifically help somebody who's in need. Um, the, the more diverse a, a group of community health workers are, I'd like to think the um, more successful or, or healthy that community has the potential to be um, because you're able to address things um, direct, in, a, in a more direct manner from a, di from a different set of understanding. So community health workers in action. Um, they um, just, I'd like to tell a story um, that actually just happened this summer. Um, we were working with a group actually with uh, hypertension um, 
and a community health worker herself had all of a sudden had a boil on her foot. She said it was, she had made some comments that said it was bothering her. Um, she wore different shoes, bought new shoes, tried to treat it with over-the-counter medications. But after about a month, um, you know, she said it was really bothering her. So she was, she went to urgent care. Um, through the summer is often a busy time for community health workers. Um, spring starts health fairs and, um, you know, we're able to be outside. The kids are out of school. So a lot of programs have um, increased um, sessions in the summer. Um, so she didn't think about it because there was a lot to do. So because community health workers, again, have the deep ties in, um, in the communities they serve in, in some cases they have experienced similar traumas as the individuals they support, um, but they're so focused, we're so focused on um, our patients or our clients that a lot of times that we tend to neglect our own needs. Um, so after two months, she ended up going to urgent care um, and they sent her immediately to the hospital where she was admitted for over six days. Um, her blood sugar was over 400. Um, her A1C ended up being uh, 12. And this is somebody who didn't even, she had, the warning signs were there, but she previously didn't suspect anything. She ha wasn't thinking, you know, she's pre-diabetic. Um, and that's in the beginning when I said, all of a sudden, you may have to make a dramatic change in your lifestyle. So this is one of those situations. Um, so I tell you this story to let you know that um, community health workers are human and the experiences that we're teaching, we also need to make sure that we're practicing self-care because a lot of times you will, um, you know, go the extra mile to do whatever you can do for your communities. You kind of have that innate um, yearning to, to be the provider as a community health worker and most more than likely you can relate to this by being in this position. It's just kind of who's drawn to um, the community health, community health worker field. Um, but hand in hand, make sure that we are taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others um, at, at the same time. Um, but listen to, you know, it's just a story. A lot of times you can, you can tell stories of experience that you have to, you know, the community members, to your clients or to your patients, um, and, it, and it helps them relate um, a little bit or maybe remember some things. So um, I hope you've gained some valuable information from this. Thank you for having me here. And I look forward to uh, any questions during the Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Danielle. And I think that speaks so clearly to exactly what Ann Langley was saying in terms of the vast number of people who are pre-diabetic and are not aware of it and, and what the repercussions of that are. So it really thrilled that uh, you provided that story and really put great context in terms of the, the work that community health workers are doing. So we do need to go back for some reason. I'm not seeing uh, Tacita slides. Hopefully we can get those back up. And I will at this time, and I'm, I wanna remind you to put questions in the Q&A, but please, if uh, we can do that. And so I wanted to tell you about Tacita Kelly. She is a patient liaison referral navigator with more than 20 years experience in supporting organizations goals. She's a skill, she's also skilled at providing patient outreach and communications. And I love this part, with the particular ability to diffuse complaints and calm concerns. So Tacita, take it away. We're thrilled that you're here and are really excited to hear your messages. Okay, thank you so much, Sue. Um, as Sue said, my name is Tacita Kelly. I I am a patient referral navigator uh, with the Maryland Primary Care Program, also the CTO program at Doctors Community Practices. Um, I have, do have a large background in diabetes uh, and also direct patient care with uh, patients that are on dialysis. So the, a lot of them are related to having diabetes. So today I'll just give you a brief description on how we um, assist our patients emotionally that uh, may be newly diagnosed with diabetes 
or just having a struggle with their self-care management. Okay, um, patients with diabetes uh, or with any other chronic illness oftentimes struggle with di disease management. Um, some feel angry, guilty, frightened about the disease, and this can lead to patients feeling unmotivated to complete di diabetes self-care tasks. This can also be become a serious or negative impact on patients if left undressed. Addressing the psychosocial factors in a treatment plan can break barriers of diabetes self-care self management. Addressing and supporting patients through their lifespan and from the time of diagnosis with proper evaluation can be a major impact with helping patients cope with their chronic illness. Um, at doctors' community practices, we use two evaluations to assess our patients with diabetes. Um, the first one you'll see is the basic health and well-being questionnaire. And this questionnaire um, allows us to measure how a patient feel and how they function on a personal and social level, or just simply how they evaluate their life as a whole. The second evaluation is geared towards just diabetes. And in this evaluation, we can, we can determine or measure how satisfied a patient is with their current treatment plan. And de de depending on these evaluations, um, we go into more further treatment plan. And we all know that since diabetes is a chronic illness that requires continuous medical care, it is very important that patients are educated to prevent and acute and long-term illnesses or complications. Um, we often refer our patients to our diabetes educational program at Doctors Community Medical Center, um, and they're able to assist our patients with nutritional therapy, diabetes educations, with exercising, um, also insulin pump training and continuous monitoring glucose. And we also have, uh, we do use a lot of uh, our community health workers for resources. They have been just, I, I can't put it into words how helpful they are. Um, they just are just wonderful. And I cannot imagine not having them on our team, to be honest with you. Um, next is sometimes just, um, introducing small new management of diabetes can help patients emotionally. You hear a lot of times about the patients not liking to stick themselves or um, carrying around those meters and the sticks um, and the strips. So I'm um, just introducing them to something new. It's um, like this Dexacom meter. Um, it's a continuous glucose monitoring and it, it connects to your smartphone. Um, you can share it with providers. And it's also a reimbursement for Medicare and um, commercial insurances as long as you're using the guidelines correctly. And also just introducing something small to the patient's change um, as far as the continuous glucose monitoring can really make an impact on them emotionally. Um, so making those small adjustments can really help them. And um, the last step in the process to me is, this is a really a major process though, is always follow up with your patients. Don't just assume just because you did an evaluation and you, um, you set them, you coordinated care with the diabetes management or diabetes education that those things did take place. So track no-shows and cancellations, track your referrals, track never scheduled appointments, um, reach out to your patients. And that's when our CHWs do come in a big 
role for us doing the community outreach and doing those referral, um, tracking those referrals and reaching out to our patients to see how they're doing and how else they can assist them. Whether it's, okay, I didn't have transportation to the, to the program and assisting them with getting transportation or um, just helping them sometimes monitoring their, um, their glucose by helping them operate in the glucose meter. It's, that's been a big challenge for a lot of our patients and the CHWs has really helped with that. And lastly, I'll just end with a small story as well. Um, we had a middle-aged patient that came in that was newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. He was having a very difficult time managing his diabetes. Um, he didn't want to disclose any of his information to his family or friends. Um, he was very embarrassed. He was frustrated. Um, he thought he had good health, so he was really embarrassed that he was diagnosed with diabetes. And he was also newly retired, so he was having um, problems with cost of the medication. Um, so once we found out all this information, we were able to sit down with him and refer him to um, the CHWs, and the CHWs were able to help him apply for the Qualified Medicare beneficiary program that assist him with additional um, insurance. Um, they were able to help him, show him how to correctly monitor his glucose. Um, he was just so happy. He, you know, he emotionally, he was able to share things with his family. He started incorporating them in with his, uh, with his appointments and he was just so impressed and so happy of how the, we were able to help him as a team um, that he had a, a, a um, neighbor that was going through sim similar to the same thing and he uh, referred them to us and um, it was just very good to hear that we helped him and was able to help someone else in the community. So. Um, just wanted to say thank you for having me and I really appreciate being here to share my stories. Wonderful, thank you very much, Tacita. And I know that uh, we are going to, to open up for Q&A, but I wanted just to check with folks uh, at this time. I have a couple of questions on Q&A, but I wondered, Danielle, if you had other uh, tips around problem solving, some of the components that people really need to work with. Both you and Tacita, I think, have wonderful uh, real life experiences. So for you to be able to share some of the additional strategies that you've used, and, and then we'll get to a couple of the questions. Either one of you, Tacita or, or Danielle? Yeah, sorry, I'm having um, issues. It says it can't detect my camera. Um, but um, just in problem solving, some of the um, questions that I see, and I think um, we'll wait to get to the questions, but um, planning ahead. So a few things I look at is um, to be prepared and survey. So what resources are already in your area? Um, any um, resource guides that may be available, and not just on, um, on specific diabetes education, but also uh, food sources, things that can help um, kind of ease the minds to help people focus on their condition. Um, adding to the resources, if you know as a community health worker that there are some things that are lacking, um, looking into um, maybe connecting the dots, so adding to the resources or what's widely available, um, advocating for something like a cooking class or making sure that there's child care at, you know, some of the, the events. Um, capacity building, looking again into what uh, community partners you have in your area, both the faith-based, um, community-based organizations, uh, how well do you know those uh, representatives, how well do you know the programs that they offer, um, whether it be diabetes prevention for pre-diabetics or CDSMP for um, diagnosed diabetics, um, but also remembering that one of the most important resources you have um, are each other and the partnerships that you have. 
Um, there's so many times when I ha was having an issue with um, a community member and really by just talking it over with another community health worker who went who happened to go through something similar, we were able to come up with the solution among us. That's terrific. And I think that makes such a huge difference. Desita, have you got more in terms of problem solving, ways to really assist that because diabetes is such a huge black box that has so many unexpected consequences? Yes. One of the um, problems that we do have a lot is the language barrier. Um, trying to find uh, the right education for patients with language barrier. We um, have come across that a lot. Um, and so we, um, a lot of times we have been doing virtual diabetes educations with patients with language barrier because we're able to um, change the language on it. So, um, and then also when we can have someone there that can also give some additional information that speaks the language. So that's one of the biggest barriers that we do have in, now in the community where I work. Yeah, and I think you're so right. And, and that's one of the real advantages of community health workers to be able to work in community. And we are doing a, a, a series of webinars for people with diabetes, pre-diabetes, and their family members. And I think so often uh, a, a family member, especially perhaps a younger person, may be able to uh, be there as well and translate, but I, I really hear that that, that can be a, an issue for sure. So we do have several questions and I encourage all of you who are on to continue to ask questions through the chat and we will open it up in just a bit for you to actually share some of your own experiences. And I want to remind you that we are recording this, so this will be available. There's folks that weren't able to come today that registered and they can watch through the webinar and still get their certificates of attendance. So uh, that's really good news. So one of the questions is, uh, are there asymptomatic people who have diabetes? Well, we certainly know that's true of pre-diabetes. Is it true as well of people who have diabetes that they may not be at all aware of it? I would say sure, because some people, um, what I've realized is that they come in and their numbers are like way high. And um, they probably just never been to the doctor for so long. And they've been feeling these symptoms, but they just associated with how they feel. Yeah. So um, they, they don't realize that those are symptoms, but they, we would consider it asymptomatic. Sure. That's absolutely, and I'm sure that's right. Anne, I don't know if you have more that you want to add to that or, or uh, Danielle? I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that there are, you know, in the data, we, we project, you know, undiagnosed, people with undiagnosed diabetes, and that when you start screening more people for prediabetes, you do find a certain percentage of people who actually already have diabetes. Right, right. And one of the questions, and I thought this was a good one, how, how would a patient actually begin to talk to their doctor about getting screened for diabetes? I think uh, this is Danielle. Um, I think by just, just doing that, just asking, you know, are there, you know, I've, I've been learning more and I think, you know, if you have a family history or even if you don't, making the question that, you know, When's the last time that you had your blood work done? Do you know what your A1C level is? Um, and asking that question. Um, sometimes it helps to take somebody with you if there's, you know, you're, you're not comfortable with maybe asking your doctor to do things. Some people have, you know, the appeal to authority, so they wait for their doctor to make the recommendation. Um, but by taking someone with you or writing things down ahead of time, questions that you have, I know doctor's visits are even virtual now, but they've kind of been shortened, but take, you know, write down a list and put your top three on. So if you're only able to get through those, then you're able to at least ask those questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And it, you know, it occurs to me that one of the challenges with diabetes is uh, it's indicated, yes, by a, a, a survey, but certainly it's critical to get that, that blood test and, and uh, the blood sugar. And so, not 
all doctor's offices are able to also do the testing. Oftentimes you have to go yet to another location, you know, to get your, the, the testing done. So, you know, I think that even in itself is, is another barrier to things. There is also a question, is there actually a CHW diabetes screening? And I don't know the answer to that. Danielle, I don't know if you do. I know there are some standardized uh, screenings, very simple ones that can be done. I don't know that we are focusing on any of those today, but we can certainly make sure we get resources to, to you that you can uh, you know, do that. And I think, uh, Tacita, you said you did a screening, of one that was specific to people already diagnosed with diabetes, or is it also for prediabetes? No, those are for people that are diabetic are and are on a treatment plan already. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So, and, go ahead. Sorry, Sue. So I am um, obviously, you know, I, I don't have the all the tricks in my bag that the community health workers have, but um, uh, I really am encouraging everybody to use the um, pre-diabetes screening test that's on. It's You can find it on the Be Healthy Maryland website, but it's also on the American Diabetes Association website. It's really their screening test. Um, I've taken it. I've taken it a couple of times. It's six questions, I think. Um, it's very easy, and but so it's, you know, it, it's, it's very easy and anybody can do it. They don't need a community health worker, but it's a great way. And all it does is just identify that person who um, has an increased risk and should, should be the one in the doctor's office saying, hey, and you can say, hey, you know, I took this screening and I tested high. Could we do my, my blood work for this? something like that, but it just, um, it's just that first cut. Um, and it's actually um, such an easy test. It, uh, it would be a nice thing for a community health worker to, to sit and do with, with somebody, at, um, just a few um, basically um, family history and lifestyle questions. And uh, so I encourage every, we will be encouraging, there will be advertising about it in all of our programs. We'll be talking about the taking you know, take the test, take this pre-diabetes screening test. That's great, and thank you. And here is a great question, and I'll bet every CHW who's here today has had had this. What suggestions would you give to a patient who forgets to take their medications consistently? Who'd like to start? Um. Hi, well, this is Danielle. Um, yes, definitely have, um, have had this happen frequently. Um, and even with myself, it's, you know, like we're learning new things. We're learning to take care of ourselves. And we have new routines that we need to incorporate. Um, a few things that I try to, um, try, to, try to use is using the pill boxes. Um, I think that kind of helps just to, you know, realize if you've forgotten it or, you know, putting it in a place where you go often, if you put your keys on the table, then have it sitting, you know, on your front table. Um, or kind of going along with that, combining it with something that you do every day. So if you, every morning you get up and make coffee, um, so having it next to the coffee pot, so that becomes your routine. You know, you take your, your medicine, you have your coffee. Or if you, you know, go to the gym a certain time, you know, right, you know with your gym bag or putting it something that you already do um, normally. Absolutely. I think sometimes there's also the the suggestion of uh, notes on the refrigerator, but also, you know, in the bathroom where you're brushing your teeth so that, again, it's right there when you're getting up in the morning or going to bed at night. Those are others. Tacita, any other ideas around assisting someone in taking their medications? Um, yes, we've recommended some patients um, set a timer on their phone. Mm -hmm to remind them that's, you know, that's been helpful to uh, some of our patients because everybody has a phone now, you know, the smartphones are just so smart. So they're smart enough to remind them at times. <laughs> that's great. And we do have a, a, a lengthy um, piece here from Rosetta. And I will just say in just a moment, we are going to 
uh, if you can raise your hand and have something to say, whether it's another question or sharing an experience, that's what we want to get to. But Rosetta says, you know, if schools are partnering in the prevention of diabetes, why haven't food choices changed? Most of the meals are high in sodium, prepackaged and boxed foods. And some days there are healthy options such as fresh fruit and carrots and packaged salad. These, the summer meals were even worse, mostly processed meals. In some communities, school meals make up the majority of a child's diet, and school meals are the only me meals that people receive. So I think, and that's that's an important one, you know, for thinking in terms of that keeping the healthy population healthy and really beginning with kids as well. So uh, there's a, ch a challenge for all of us. And what I'm going to do now is to suggest if you have again a question or a story you would like to share. If you will raise your hand, which you can do, I can uh, open up your mic. Let me see, I haven't seen anybody raise your hand. So keep thinking about this because this is a real opportunity for you to share your own experiences, what's worked with you, what isn't working. Don't be so silent, y'all. All right, we've got one. Here we go. All right, so Angela, you can unmute your phone, please. Hi. Great. All right, um, I find it easier to um, take my diabetic medicine, like my insulin and stuff like that. I find it easier to have it beside my bed. Now the needles, she told me I could keep it beside my bed because if I'm taking 50 units, that's only going to last like four or five days. So I'll be, you know, it don't have to be in the refrigerator. It can be right beside my bed. So that's a good way to keep up with your medicine. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, so you can unmute if you are mute again, if you would. And I'm going to turn over to Rosetta uh, and I am going to unmute you. Good morning, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. I have a question. When the CHW works with a client um, who has diabetes or they're pre-diabetic because it's such a big issue and it's also an issue for the youth, is the whole family addressed or, or they just focus on the client? That's a great question. And I, I think both Tacita and Danielle can, can really tell you what it's like in the field and the importance of including family members. Which one of you would like to go first? Um, I can go. Um, yes, it's definitely important to include the family. Um, you know, especially when it comes to signs and symptoms of hypoglycemic, it's very important that the family is involved so they can know what to do do, what not to do, um, and also to be um, encouraging the patient to, um, you know, to have the correct self-care management. So including a family is 100% um, effective and important. Great. Danielle, more to add to that? Yes, I would definitely agree. It, it helps with the, the overall support system. Um, one of the complaints that I've often had with, you know, the diabetes care, with, there's one program for pre-diabetics and there's another program if you've been diagnosed. Um, so I always thought it'd be fantastic if those programs could kind of merge together because oftentimes those people are living in the same house. You know, they're, they're pre-diabetics, you know, understanding or watching what their other loved one has to go through, but not realizing all the things that, you know, that have led up to that situation. And if you're working together with everybody changing, you know, their lifestyle, everybody may be going out for a walk together or changing the things that we even buy that come into the house, uh, we can really help each other. And it's all about the support. So I think including the family is, is key to really um, being successful. And right. so if I can just add, um, it's been great for me to hear recently the, um, you know, the diabetes prevention program is a pro growing program. It's uh, evidence-based, it's been proven to work. Um, Medicaid now covers it. And I'm, I've now started to see some expansion in different ways. And one of them is um, a provider 
who's offering a program now. Um, and they, they ask that two people come, either two very close friends or two people from the same household, that they participate together. Um, and um, that that um, improves, it, people come to class more often, they are able to engage more and they take more of it with them. And um, I also heard about a federal grant recently that was flowing through the University of Maryland, but would be going to a few programs across the state um, who want to, to do a more family oriented approach to diabetes prevention. So um, we're probably like a little later in doing all that than we should have been because it's very, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm glad to see uh, things moving in that direction. I think you're so right. And that accountability piece, if you've got a partner, whether it's somebody from your family or, or a friend, makes a huge difference. And particularly when the, the pre-diabetes program is such a lengthy one, you know, that you, they really can kind of have a little competition and make sure that, that both of them are really continuing. And so we do have some additional questions here in the Q&A. Are there any educational resources that you can recommend to CHWs for motivational interviewing and goal setting? So MDH, I know uh, through the, the uh, and Sue Baith is gonna be talking on our next uh, webinar with you all. There's absolutely motivational interviewing training that goes on frequently. Uh, again, through the Maryland Department of Health, and I'm uh, happy to connect folks to Sue Vaith. Again, she'll be on our webinar on the 26th, but again, very important. Uh, you know, we're, I, I do a lot of work with uh, depression, and one of the things that uh, I find is the CHWs and the people who take the training are are caretakers and and action oriented to solve problems and the challenge always is we want to fix everything for people but self-management is around helping the individual to be able to take those steps and it's a really fine line to walk between one and the other but because all of you uh, are dedicated to really helping people in community who need need your help. But remember that motivational interviewing is what will allow the individual to identify what their goals are, set those as the next direction. And so yes, we, we will get that to you and I, I will send out uh, uh, emails to the AHEX and others of you to make sure that you know how to connect with the next motivational interviewing. Uh, another good question is considering hosting diabetes educational classes within communities. So right now we're challenged because of COVID, but most of the counties are beginning to do some work in terms of doing virtual workshops for diabetes self-management. And again, that Be Healthy Maryland site, we'll make sure that you have that, uh, posts all of the trainings that are going on in the state, all of the workshops. And we do plan to do more leader trainings. We have folks who are just now gonna be getting ready uh, to, to train additional leaders in these programs. But right now, the majority of programs, almost every place are virtual, which is good in one respect because if you're from Maryland, any place in the state, we can take you into those programs. Uh, and everybody will you know, work together through, most of them are six or seven weeks, but again, highly effective. So I'm glad that question was asked. Uh, and then are there more aggressive action steps in preventing diabetes in our youth? Again, I think that's an important question. And I, I know the diabetes five-year plan really looks at the entire population across the age span. And do you have a little bit more information on some of the strategies around working with youth? Um, so I'll play my, I've only been here six months card. <laughs> okay. And um, I mean, I, I there are some strategies, I, I'll, you know, be very, very honest, I, there are a couple of people on here who, who know me, um, and that's my hallmark. <laughs> but, you know, I, um, 
when I read the plan, like the working with the kids is one of the challenges that I am most daunted by. Um, the question about the school lunches is a really important. It's a great point. I, I, you know, we will be talking with the schools and I'll be working on that, but I worry about the intra, you know, like we all know the kids should be eating healthier. Why wouldn't they have already done that? I'm, I'm worried about what, what I can do um, to really push that. And the, you know, physical activity um, for kids, uh, same thing. I understand the problem. I hear from parents and, and teachers about you know, the change in kids' behaviors and the less, and they don't have money for physical activity. And now kids are sitting at home. They don't even have a class to go out with. These are really important problems. And I can't tell you what my plan is to solve them, but I know that, um, you know, we would, we must, you know, of, of our, the next five years has to include a really thoughtful um, strategy for changing things for kids because, um, you know, that's the upstream solution that um, I wish we could spend more time on. There's a lot of time and energy spent because people need to manage their diabetes better. But if we could just focus more on on these kids and um, and people who are healthy and, and how to support them. So, so um, I'm trying. I welcome any input about um, creative things to do. Um, I promise I'm going to go talk to the school districts about the food they're serving, but I'm not looking forward to it. Well, and thank you. And, and I do think, uh, you know, ways to include some of the community health workers in some of your information sharing pieces would really be helpful because they certainly are out in community and are, are knowing, again, what's going on. Uh, another question comes from Bobby Jean, which is there are still many people without primary care. Are there resources for screening if the client does not have a primary care physician? And again, uh, you know, with, with Medicaid and other services, there, there should be uh, uh, more accessibility. Uh, one of the other pieces, and uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but the uh, the state of Maryland, in terms of the next plan for the hospitals, is requiring initial major focus on diabetes and prediabetes. So the hospitals are going to be tasked with really expanding their outreach. And so I think here is an opportunity where we can really begin to, to get more of those resources. The other piece, and again, I know we're gonna talk about this probably in the next webinar with you all, is uh, local health departments have many resources. Oftentimes uh, the, the needles, some of the other pieces that are not readily available, they have through some grants. So again, looking at other community organizations within your community, in particular, the local health department may be another good place to look for some of those resources for people who don't have it. And, and the reality is here that uh, we need to be working to make sure everyone is connected to primary care. So trying to identify and connect somebody to a health care provider is really an important piece. Yes, yeah, so can I just add on to that? Um, this is something that I'm really passionate about. And this is, you know, I came from the hospital industry and I ran a program for people who were, didn't have insurance and couldn't get insurance. So I, the access issues, and this puts a lot on you all, the community health workers, but I just have to tell you, like, just don't take no for an answer. There's no reason for anybody in the state of Maryland, we have more doctors than most states. There's no reason for anybody not to have a primary care provider. And if they don't have a regular one, some people I've worked with kids, they don't really want a regular one, but there is a place for everybody to go and get um, health care that they need to get a blood test to check for this. I mean, to get whatever it is that they need. And, and I know it's not easy. I'm not saying that and saying, well, you know, people just aren't trying, but I, I've seen some really amazing community health workers find um, chronically ill, elderly Medicare patients in East Baltimore, finding them all primary care doctors, and I don't know how they did it. Anybody with insurance 
anybody with insurance has a right to a primary care doctor who will see them, one who's convenient for them. So push for that. 99% of the people who are uninsured in the state can't get insurance. They're largely immigrants. There are places for them to go. Um, there's more uh, in the city and the near DC than there is out on the Eastern shore. Um, that's a bigger problem, but um, really this is an area where strong advocacy, don't take no for an answer. Um, people, they're, they're, there's sufficient services out there and patients have a right to the care. Um, the insurance companies are getting money for all those Medicaid patients. Every insurance, every insurance company is getting money so that they get their primary care and they're obligated by law to provide a primary care provider that is accessible to that person. So yeah, push that's, for it. That's great. And just to let you know, we are also doing uh, three webinars with uh, primary care. We're partnering with the, the Maryland uh, primary care program to really get the docs involved and make them understand and aware of the resources that are out there. You all can attend any and all of the webinars. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you attend the, the clinical ones, whether you attend the ones for people with prediabetes and diabetes, they're all open to you and they are all also going to be recorded. So there could be really good information. And just as you're answering questions here, there would be opportunities to bring some of these issues to the physicians and certainly, you know, hearing from people with diabetes, I think you, you all are already doing that, but, but we do have three webinars that are really targeting uh, so that we can hear from them and also provide information. Uh, another question comes from Melvin that, and that is at what level can or should diabetes be tracked and followed by the doctor versus the patient? Tasita, you probably have some information on that. I would think if someone is, has a diagnosis of diabetes, they need to have regular visits with their primary care physician. Yes, usually we typically uh, monitor our patients um, on a three month basis mm -hmm. or sometimes uh, sometimes a six weeks basis, depending on um, if they have other complications or if they have uncontrolled diabetes, we try to uh, follow up them with a little bit more, with a more rigorous um, treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And and there but are now, and I think, I think one of you actually had an example of that continuous monitoring uh, device that continually can show if yes. someone's really, uh, unable to really control their diabetes, then that really is a key piece and those are available. You know, because we now have telehealth, a lot of this technology is now available for the doctors to prescribe. It's covered by Medicare. So again, really important that the physicians understand that these things are available and that they can utilize them. Uh, so, th you know, because of COVID, we're making a lot of changes and that opening of that whole telehealth approach is really an important one as well. Uh, and then any, oh, this is an easy one. Any suggestions on how to incorporate or increase exercise within the population uh, of folks who have diabetes? That's simple, right? Come on, Danielle, come on to CD, you can answer that one. You got to be unmuted though to answer it. There you go. <laughs> okay, there you go. Go ahead, Danielle. I'll wait. So yeah, in, incorporating um, exercise into our programs. I mean, a lot of more things are um, provide us exercise than we think of. So if you think just getting the house clean, <laughs> I mean, so put on a little bit of music and you know, and and dance around while you're doing that. Um, when you're going outside and playing, I know we have to stay socially distanced. Um, 
staying socially distanced, but in encouraging us to spend time with our families. So we're working on our mental health. Also, spending time outside is good for our mental health, but, you know, taking a walk. A lot of times there's, you know, we are taxed with other things that we have to do and making sure that we're keeping on track with our responsibilities, but just encouraging and, and focusing that um, our mental health is part of our health. Also, our, mental, our mentality plays a big role in our physical health. Um, so continuously encouraging people to put a focus on that as well and not put it on the back burner, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Great. Tacita, do you have more you want to add? Yes. Uh, we a lot of time encourage our patients to find a hobby that's going to get them moving, whether it's just going into the yard or playing with the grandchildren or right now it's kind of hard to get into the exercising classes, but there are Zoom classes that you can get into now with the exercising. So, you know, just making those small adjustments of just finding a hobby that gets you moving. So we encourage our patients to definitely find something that, that's going to get them moving. That's great, thank you. And there's a comment from Tracy who says, the numbers that Ann stated today are astonishing. Will, will they be released to the public? And I know there are multiple strategies to share the burden, to share the resources moving forward, right, Ann? Yes, and every number that I said this morning is in the Diabetes Action Plan, which is on the website. Good, so it's just, you know, it's, it's a big document. So figuring out how to get some of those pieces uh, very specifically out into the population and in a meaningful way that they can really realize that it's affecting all of us. So that, Yeah, that's and that's, when I said um, there are some other things on the website when you go to that link in addition to the plan, one of them is this one pager. Um, and that's a really nice summary of Good most of those numbers so if because the plan is daunting um it's packed with information but um yeah. it's hard to tease it out but that one pager is definitely something you can reference and and hand to people it's it's very accessible good good and we'll probably download that as well and make that available to people and you know here's a, a great question and we actually have a session on this uh in I have to tell you, I believe it is the 29th with physicians and the same question. When, when is it that a person with diabetes should have an endocrinologist as their doctor rather than their primary care doctor? So again, we are doing a, a, a session specifically on that. Uh, and I would say there are a number of strategies in terms really I would think, and, and again, I, I defer to the experts on the panel here, but I, I believe it really has to do with how, how well managed that uh, blood, sugar, blood glucose is. And if they're, if they're not able to manage it, and, and certainly they have more and more of the other issues in terms of uh, you know, their conditions, it, it may be the time and the most appropriate. But again, I, to see, I see your head check, shaking. So. Other information there? No, I, just, I think you hit it right nail on. If the if the diabetes is really under under control under uncontrolled, I'm sorry, and the primary care has exhausted all of their resources for that patient, um, they usually will refer them to an endocrinologist. Great. Uh, and then to see, because this, I think you're the one that maybe right now has more information. I know we will be doing a webinar. Uh, I believe, though, it is one for uh, uh, people with diabetes about some of the devices and tablets and some, some of the things that can be used. But you, could you talk a little bit, do you know about some of the other new devices uh, that people can use. I know that there are those, you know, easy monitoring that does reporting. So anything else? Um, that's the biggest one right now, because you know, you 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 don't have to carry around that glucose meter with um, the needle and also the strips. So that's one of the major things a lot of the patients are getting into because um, you know, with the logging as well 
you know, the, pay, the doctor, the providers will ask you, well, what is your blood, what's your blood sugar's been? And you don't have to log that anymore. It goes to your smartphone and then it connects to the provider as well. And it's safe and secure. Um, and the patients really love it because you can shower with it. You can put it, you know, different places on your body and you just change it every so often. Often, but there are requirements with it. Um, usually, they're for people that um, are insulin dependent um, and are, who, who needs to take their glucose more often than someone that's not insulin dependent. But the Dexacom is becoming a very, very popular device with diabetes patients. Good. And also the insulin pump. Um, because you don't have to dial up, you don't have to, you know, stick yourself. It's there and it, it you know, it, um, it's just e easier and more convenient. Great. That's great. Uh, and then there is a question about any apps that are good to use if you have a child under 13 who is pre-diabetic. You may have stumped us, Shaleen, on that one. You may have stumped us <laughs> because I, unfortunately I don't deal with the adolescents. I do apologize. Yeah. You know, but there are more and more apps all the time. And so I do think, uh, again, there are a lot around, you just think about, you know, the 10,000 steps and other pieces. There may be some things that are coming with that, because I would think that the uh, the exercise piece would be one component of that that would be, you know, valuable even for, for and I have a 15-year-old grandson, so I know He's on some tech device all the time, right? It's, it's on his smartphone, he's, he's on a computer, he's on any number of things. So I think the plus in terms of communicating effectively with uh, you know, younger folks, teens, preteens even, they, they really are connected to internet apps. And so there really should be the resources for development of some of those things. I think that is it with the questions. That was great. We had a huge number and tremendous input. I want to remind all of you, please, there will be a post survey as soon as the webinar is over. Please complete that. You need to complete that in order to get your certificate of attendance. Uh, and again, these webinars are all being recorded. You can attend any of them and receive a certificate for attending. You will need to do a register, a pretest, and then do a post test after listening to uh, either the live webinar or the recorded webinar. We're so excited that we were able to talk with you today, to hear from you, to hear your concerns. I know that uh, Anne, who is the head of population health at the Maryland Department of Health has already made a few promises today and, and you know, we are uh, truly thrilled that you were with us, but know that the work that you are doing in community is very important to really all of Maryland being able to address this. So thank you very much. Any last words from anybody? No, I'd just like to thank everybody. And um, um, I, I just want to say thank to you for having me. Oh, I'm sorry, Anne. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I'm just glad we're all in this together. We're gonna yes. solve this together. There you go. It will take yes, everyone. Yeah. It will, absolutely. It will, it does. Good. Take care, everybody. Be safe and enjoy the day. Thank you for being with us.